Hello and welcome to the Varsity Tutors Special Education Collection, where it's part of our ongoing mission to ensure that every unique learner can find the personalized resources and instruction to help them not just thrive academically, but really enjoy learning and, and progress toward their, uh, their specific goals. We've been honored to have a, a group of distinguished speakers throughout the winter and spring here to help talk to parents and give insight into working with students with learning differences. And tonight, we've got one of those most esteemed speakers here, Dr. Temple Grandin, uh, whose insight into the minds with autism has, uh, has inspired many and really revolutionized the way a lot of people think about learning differences and not through the old lens of learning disabilities. And so we're thrilled to have her here talking about different kinds of minds, which is a topic near and dear to all of our hearts. Now, before we get started, I want to give you a bit of an orientation to the way we do these large format classes. And I should say this is a large format class. There are thousands of you out there, and we really do appreciate it. For one, uh, Dr. Grandin will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, but then we want to make sure this is really interactive for all of you. So throughout the program, don't wait until it's topically relevant. If you have any questions, we want to spend a lot of our time on sort of an interview format, and I'll introduce our facilitator, Doreen Fazin, in just a moment, who will be answer, uh, asking all those questions so we can get answers. Um, so keep the questions coming, and, and we'll have a team monitoring those and kind of packaging them together so that our Doreen can ask Dr. Grant as many questions that get us as many answers as will help the majority of us. We also have a bit of a challenge for all of you out there. There are thousands of you here right now, but tens if not hundreds of thousands of folks not here who could really benefit from a lot of this wisdom. So we're running a challenge. If you post something you learned or something you found particularly helpful tonight to social media, and on our way out, we'll put up a slide that has the, uh, the tags for Dr. Grand and for Varsity Tutors on Instagram and Twitter. If you post something you learned to social media, you'll be entered to win a prize that will include five hours of one-on-one -on -one tutoring for the, the learner in your life through Varsity Tutors and a signed copy of, of one of Dr. Grandin's books. And we'll make sure it's personalized to, uh, to be able to help you and, and be a book that's additive, maybe one that you, you haven't yet read. So with all that, I wanna turn it over to our facilitator, Doreen Fazin. Doreen runs the Learning Differences programs and, and really got those going here at Varsity Tutors. In addition to that, she's a parent who has gone through many of the trials and triumphs that Dr. Grandin will be speaking about tonight. So I wanna introduce Doreen Fazin, who will facilitate tonight's discussion. Hi there, thank you, Brian, and hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Brian said, I'm Doreen Fazin, and I oversee all of our programs that support students with learning differences. I myself have a 20-year-old son with autism, as well as a 16-year-old daughter with dyslexia, so I'm very grateful to be in a position where I can help others who learn differently. Autism involves a spectrum of learning differences that impact students in many different ways, in the same way that you could not use a single child's experience to describe the experiences of all children, you cannot look at one person with autism and assume they represent everyone with autism. I was able to hear Dr. Grandin speak about 15 years ago. I took away many things that helped me figure out how to understand my own son. My goal in having Dr. Grandin share her pers perspective today is to give families and people who know someone with autism at least some insight into how a person with autism may experience the world. So with that, let me, I'm very, very pleased to introduce Dr. Temple Grandin. Well, it's great to be here virtually. And I uh, will introduce myself. I'm Temple Grandin, a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. Well, I've worked in the cattle industry for years and years on equipment. Um, I have a whole other career that doesn't have anything to do with autism. And I think it's important that you know about that. Autism is an important part of who I am, but having a good career comes first. And I've worked with a lot of people out in the industry that are probably on the spectrum. I've been out to the Silicon Valley tech companies. A lot of those programmers are on the spectrum. The problem we've got with autism is it's such a range. Einstein had no speech until age three. He'd probably be labeled on the spectrum. Then you have somebody that never learns to talk and has a lot more challenges. You have this huge spectrum and, and they're very different with different skills. Now, one of the things that in autism is sensory issues. These are extremely variable. One person will have a problem with noise sensitivity. Another person might have a problem with a, a certain LED lights that flicker. Very, very, very variable. Now there's some kids that might hate a sound like a hairdryer or a vacuum cleaner. And if they can control it, where they turn it on and off, you might be able to help desensitize that. But sensory problems are real and they are re really variable. Some kids will need to take breaks because if there's a lot of background noise, it's very difficult for them to hear. And 
one of the most important things I want to talk about is the different kinds of minds. Kids with learning differences, whether they're autistic or they have some other label like specific learning disorder, whatever that means, they tend to have uneven skills. They'll be really good at one thing and really terrible at something else. And often we put way too much emphasis on the stuff they're bad at and not enough emphasis on building up the strength. My strength was art. My mother encouraged me to do lots of drawing, lots and lots of different kinds of art. And the kind of mind I have is what's called an object visualizer. And there's scientific research to show this is true. And if you watch the HBO movie they made about me, Mick Jackson, the director, shows my visualization exactly right. That part of the movie is absolutely correct. Now, an object visualizer thinks in photos, doesn't think in words, thinks in photos. Now, one of the problems that we have is we absolutely can't do algebra. I never have passed algebra. And I'm seeing that as a big barrier. And there's a lot of careers you don't need it. High-end skilled trades is one of them. And I've uh, worked with um, every single one of the major meat companies and they're putting up a new factory and I'm out there and you got that super clever guy who can build anything and uh, he can't do algebra, but he may have a private jet. So you don't be sticking your nose up at this stuff. We need the object visualizers. Another kind of mind is what's called the visual spatial. That's your mathematics mind. And unfortunately, in a lot of the research has been done, the object visualizers and the visual spatial are mixed together and that's wrong. Because the visual spatial is more the pattern thinker. This is your mathematician. This is the kid who like music. This is the kid that Silicon Valley will hire for programming. Uh, he's gonna eat up algebra and thinks that's just great. And um, these kids often have some trouble with reading. Now, when I was eight years old, I could not read. And they were teaching with sight words. And uh, that didn't work for me. I was a phonics learner. But then there'll be another kid who's going to be a sight word learner. And if you shove phonics down his throat, you're going to mess him up. You know, this is where the minds are different. Then we have our verbal thinkers. And a lot of people in the field of education are verbal. And one of the big problems we have with the verbal thinkers is they overgeneralize. They'll say, well, how do I teach kids with autism? Well, little kids, I can tell you about early intervention programs with lots of turn taking. But you might, is it bullying the problem? Or is it um, can't do math? Or you can't stand the noise in the classroom? That's not enough information. Now, right before COVID started, for a couple of years before that, um, a lot of grandfathers would come up to me at autism conferences, and they had discovered that they were on the spectrum when the kids got diagnosed. But grandfather has a decent job, like NASA space scientist or accountant or an engineer out working for a computer company. And one of the reasons why he has a decent job is because the people in my generation learned working skills. I'm seeing too many kids, they're not learning shopping. They're not learning basic life skills. Now, the first step in understanding the different kinds of minds is realizing they exist. And in my book, The Autistic Brain, I um, provide uh, the studies that show that I'm not just telling you a bunch of stuff. This is evidence-based. And that book came out in 2013. And there's been a whole bunch more studies to just back up what I have to say, especially about the object visualizer and then the visual spatial math mind. And then in my book, Thinking in Pictures, that's where I describe thinking in pictures. Now, when I was young, I thought everybody thought in pictures. I didn't know that my thinking was different. And then I sort of had an, you know, kind of a little revelation when I got to talking to a speech therapist and I'd ask her, you know, think about a church steeple. Now, when I ask that question to most people, they'll start name it, they'll, they'll just, you know, give me some kind of vague form about it. The visual thinker like me will name them off because they come up like PowerPoint slides, just like the movie shows. But the ultra verbal thinker just gets this. This was a shock to me that that's all they got. And there are a few people that have ant fantasia and they've got absolutely no visual thinking at all but they might be really good at math. So the first step is realizing that these different kinds of minds exist and they have different skill abilities. Now, the thing that was interesting in working on building these big factories is that the degree to engineer who can do algebra and all the mathematics stuff, he does the boilers and the refrigeration equipment, make sure the roof trusses aren't gonna collapse under snow load, soil compaction, water and power, but then us people can't do algebra. We build all the clever things that are inside. And right now we have two state-of-the-art poultry plants where all the clever equipment inside was imported from Holland. 
very expensive high wage country. And it goes back to our educational system, taking out the high end skilled trades classes. We need these people. You need the visual thinkers to prevent messes like Fukushima. When I found out why that reactor burned up, I'm going, how could you do this? This is so basic. How could you not see it? Well, the engineer mathematician calculates risk. I see it. It's not a very good idea when you live next to the sea to put that super important electrically operated emergency cooling pump in a non-waterproof basement. How about some watertight doors? Then it wouldn't have happened. Okay, let's look at some of the things where some of these kids have problems. And this is a lot of autistic kids, regardless of what type of thinker they are, have problems with multitasking. A super busy McDonald's takeout window would not be a good choice of a job. I cannot multitask. Just today, I was trying to write down a Zoom uh, meeting number that was in a sea of other gobbledygook. Uh, my student came in. I said, wait a minute, I've got to pay attention. So I write this number down correctly. You see, that's an example of not multitasking. See, if I was a computer, I'd be the Intel 286 with a really tiny little pr processor, but I got the cloud for graphics files. I can really remember graphics files. So that makes me really good at design. And one of the things I learned is when you're really weird, the way you have to sell your work is you just got to show it to people. So I'll show you one of my drawings. Here's some of my drawings right there. Let's hopefully you can see that. When you're weird, you learn to sell your work. And we've got to get these kids out doing things. What you got to do with these kids is you've got to stretch them. You don't throw them into a bunch of sensory overload. You don't do that, but you got to stretch and give some choices because I'm seeing too many kids that I'll be going out and getting good careers, getting addicted to video games and just going nowhere. And that's visual thinkers. We're the worst on the video game addiction stuff. And there's been some successes with uh, introducing auto mechanics really slowly. So people ask me, what could I do to improve education? We need to be keeping all our hands on classes, art, sewing, woodworking, theater. Well, I wasn't that interested in acting in the place, but I loved making costumes and scenery. My high school did trial by jury. I made all the courtroom sets out of washing machine boxes. That's kind of stuff I like doing. And we need the different kinds of minds. And what I wanna write, do right now is we'll open it up for lots of questions. Uh, we'll have a lot more things to talk about. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Grandin. One of the first questions that has come in is, uh, let's see where it is. What inspired you to start speaking about autism? Well, I got invited to my first meeting. My very first meetings I spoke at were cattle meetings. And one of the things I learned early on is have good slides. Because when I was a, a, a teaching assistant for a psychology class, I panicked and walked out of my first talk. So you either got to have really good notes or you got to have really good slides. And um, I got invited, first of all, by when I was living in Arizona in my late 20s, the local autism group. Then I started doing some talks um, for um, uh, an association that trained occupational therapists. And then from that, I got a contact to do my first book, Emergence Labeled Autistic. But the thing I'm seeing now that worries me is I'm seeing too many kids that just want to do autism activism and nothing else. And I tell them, you're going to be a better activist if you can go get a good job and keep it and explain how to do that. And, and I'm not going to let autism take over. I'm still teaching my class. I've got a Zoom call next week on some problems at, with the plants, technical problems we've got to fix. I think it's important that I still have a real job. And, and I don't want to be normal because I like the logical way I think. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Related to your career, um, another question we got was, why did you decide to become an author? What inspired you to write your first book? Well, I had somebody approach me about it. That's how it happened. Uh, and, and, it, and some of the books I got approached, like my very first livestock book, um, they'd seen a lot of my articles and I got an approach to edit a textbook on, on livestock handling with guest authors. That was in the early 90s. And I did emergence in the mid eighties So thinking in pictures, an agent approached me after Oliver Sacks wrote an article about me. And this brings up another thing, seeing doors. If you watch the HBO movie, there's a scene where I go up and I get the editor's card. 
This is the editor of our State Farm magazine. Because I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would really, really help my career. That's seeing doors. Now, half of all good jobs come through connections. We need to short circuit a lot of the interview process. Because the way I sold jobs is I simply showed off the work. Drawings, pictures, trade magazine articles I had written through my getting that card. I find a lot of people, are, they don't look for the resources in the neighborhood. What's a nice little quiet shop the kid could work in? It's right in the neighborhood. And, and they're getting too stuck in the autism mindset. I want to bust up the medical model some. I can really tell you a funny medical model about an airplane. She got rounded. She had a microbleed in the anterior proximal rotary appendage. That's some good gobbledygook. And they had three mechanics with the aviation illumination probe examining her before they decided to ground her. She was one of my flights. She was grounded. Fortunately, we were at a base and we got another plane. But that's good gobbledygook. I'm sure you don't know what's wrong with that plane. But it's accurate gobbledygook. That makes sense. Um, one of our questions from our audience was, can you review what the different types of minds are again? You listed what them out, but yeah, they'd love to know. All right, that. let's just do that really slowly now. The first kind of mind that's me, the, sci the scientific word for it. This is the word you have to use if you want to look at the scholarly literature. Object visualizer. I'm an object visualizer. Now, in some of my earlier writing, I called it photorealistic. But the scientific term, applying to papers, is object visualizer. And everything I see comes up like a photograph. And it's associative. And, and uh, it's associative. It's not linear. It's non-linear thought. And algebra doesn't make any sense to me. I still haven't passed an algebra class. Thank goodness in 67, it wasn't required and I got out of it. And statistics, it was tutor, 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 tutor. Okay, the next kind of mind is visual spatial. That's the scientific name for the more mathematical mind. Now where the research literature gets messed up is that the object visualizers like me are getting merged into the visual spatial and they're getting mixed together. They are different things. And what the scientific research shows is an extreme object visualizer like me will never be good at the math stuff. And the extreme math person, not going to be like me. They're opposite traits in the brain. Now, a lot of people are kind of a mixture in the middle, kind of sort of mixtures. Then you have the pure verbal person, very linear. Um, I'm, 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 working, I'm working on another book on visual thinking with my fabulous co-author, Betsy. She is completely linear. I like to look at data on tables. I just discovered she hates tables. Well, I'm going to have to get rid of the table and try to explain it verbally. But the first step is realizing that these differences exist. And the different minds, when you're working in the real world, like running a business, building a factory, they have complementary skills. Let's take Zoom. There's a reason why Zoom took over. Because a visual thinker probably made the interface. The engineers did the programming. And the engineers have put so many features on it, I can't understand. I was just on an awful platform just earlier today. I really, I, it was stupid, some of the things that were on it. And the guy who does Zoom used to work for WebEx. And WebEx wouldn't do what he wanted, so he started Zoom and put them out of business. Yeah, it was easy to use. Yeah. I don't have to learn how to use it. I don't really want to spend an hour online learning how to use some stupid, awful platform. Uh, but that's the different kinds of thinking. Object visualizer, that's me. Visual spatial is actually the correct term for the mathematician. But the research literature mixes it up and put them together in this other research literature that doesn't. And then a purely verbal person. Highly linear in their thinking. You see, when I, um, you know, let's say I'm reading a report on, on the amount of cattle that are sold around the world or something like that. I prefer the pie chart. And the verbal thinker hates the pie chart. I look at the tables in the, in the pie chart. Like how many cattle, let's say something like, how, many, how much beef is exported to different countries? I'd rather just look at the pie chart. Yeah. The verbal thinker would rather look at the a written narrative of it. So that's just a real simple example of of uh, 
you know, the different kinds of thinking, but each kind of thinker brings different skills to the table that are important. And I'm very concerned that this big algebra requirement, you're screening kids out of auto mechanics. You don't need algebra for that. I can size a hydraulic cylinder. You don't need algebra for that. You need old fashioned 60s and 50s style arithmetic for that. Find the area of a circle. Figure out how much pressure per square inch. You know, this, I, I know how to do that. You can't that makes sense. That. But I know how to- now, with, As I you describe to, these- Size hydraulic cylinders. Yeah, as you describe these, you've given a few examples, which is very helpful. But for, a, for all the parents out there, we've got one question that came in where, as we, as we observe our own children, how can we figure out what type of mind our own children have so that we can start to, you know, directing their learning a little bit more? I get that question all the time. Um, little three-year-olds, you usually can't. Uh, it didn't get really obvious in me until I was seven and eight years old. And that's when the art ability really came out. When I was five, I remember painting a Valentine that it was like no art ability. It was kids poster paint blob messes. I, I remember making that Valentine. But the, the art kids will tend to like drawing. They also like to build things with Legos. And another big mistake we're making today is we're not introducing tools. We've got kids growing up today that have never used tools. I was using tools second and third grade. Now the math kid's gonna be good at math. Now, I don't know about some of this uh, core, uh, core curriculum stuff. I looked up first, second, and third grade lessons, and I'm going, oh, man, you've got to be kidding. But a real math head, he's, this is the kid you give him an old-fashioned algebra book. He'll either be an algebra head or a geometry head. But they like the old-fashioned books, all no verbal stuff, and then just give them numbers. Get them on looking at patterns. You want to see some cool patterns? Go into Google Images and type in protein symmetry. Wolfram Mathematica, fantastic uh, website. And, and what you need to do with that kid is move them ahead in math. But maybe you need to give them some different kinds of math. Uh, uh, see, with a verbal thinker, one of the big problems is very linear, but also very much tends to generalize and go, we're just going to do this one curriculum for all the kids. And uh, they, they may be a curriculum that's great with the little kids, but then when you get up to seventh and eighth grade, I just talked to teacher just last night that was not allowed to bring the periodic table of the elements into a seventh or eighth grade chemistry class because it went against some teaching theory. And her principal, who was an English major, English teacher, said, no, you cannot bring the periodic table of the elements in there because it's not the right grade for that. That's just ridiculous. Now, I'm not suggesting that for the second grade but there's some kids where they're gonna eat the periodic table of the elements up and they should be exposed to it. See, that's being too rigid. So usually it comes out and, and uh, move them ahead in math. They may need special ed and reading. That's where he's gonna need some help. And I learned by phonics and other kids gonna learn by, whole, by sight words or some other method. Use the thing that works. I went from no reading to sixth grade reading. I was eight. In uh, you know about two months of my mother's tutoring sessions in phonics at the kitchen table, that but sense. that's basically the the way the different minds work, and it's very well researched right now in the object visualization and the more mathematical mind. There's a lot of evidence based papers on that now. Use the keywords object visualizer and visual spatial. Right. That's the correct terms to use on Google Scholar. You want to find these papers. All right. A little bit of a different question from the audience. What is the the project that you worked on that was your most favorite project of all time? Well, the most important piece of equipment I designed is a center track restrainer system. And if you really want to look at that, you can look up beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin. But the thing that probably improved animal welfare the most was a very simple scoring system I made for evaluating meat plants. You know, you just measure things like falling. Okay, so stunner work each time. You're going to get booted off the McDonald's approved supplier list. If you can't shoot 95% of those cattle dead on the first shot, you're going to get delisted. Very simple, straightforward scoring system. And you can go on my website, grandon.com. Grandon.com is my livestock website. Templegrandon.com is my autism website. I got two websites, one for livestock, one for autism. And when I worked with the McDonald's people and the Wendy's people on uh, implementing the system, we saw more change. And this was back in 1999. 
And out of 75 plants, only three had to build something expensive. It was repairs and maintenance and a lot of non-slip flooring and three managerectomies. This gets back to the importance of management. Management's got to get out there and same thing with schools. Gets back to the management. Makes sense, makes sense. Uh, and a different question. How old were you when you were diagnosed and, and how were you diagnosed? Well, I'm 73 years old. So you've got to remember that when I was diagnosed, doctors didn't even know what autism was. Fortunately, my mother took me into a neurologist and a very, very forward thinking neurologist named Bronson Crothers. And um, he uh, most definitely very nonverbal, full blown autistic behaviors and did check me for deafness. You always got to check kids for deafness and an EEG, and I did not have petite mal epilepsy. And this uh, doctor referred my mother to a little speech therapy clinic that two teachers taught in the basement of their house. They were just really good teachers, lots of emphasis on turn-taking games. So the original diagnosis is some kind of brain damage. And then the autism came in later. And I'm old enough that my mother was not subjected to all the rubbish about refrigerator mothers and all that stuff causing it. See, that came about 10 years later. Um, but, uh, you know, there's no question about it. Uh, you know, and I was completely nonverbal. I was the kind of kid that used to just put in an institution, but the more Asperger kid where there's no speech delay, they usually went out and got jobs because in my generation, they taught manners, they taught social skills, job skills were learned earlier. So most of the Asperger kids went out and got jobs. Now where an autism diagnosis was helpful was with their relationships. That makes sense. In, in, the, in the movie that highlights your life, there is a, a whole segment on, on the squeeze machine that you yep. created. And just the, can, uh, we have a bunch of questions coming in about the role of just compression and how that helps with calming. Well, for some people, deep pressure over wide areas of the body is very calming. And I got the idea from a cattle squeeze chute. Talk about sizing cylinders. I made sure I sized the cylinder on that so that if the maximum amount of air coming out of that air compressor couldn't crush me, you do that by sizing the cylinder. You don't need algebra for that. No, if I put this too big a cylinder on that, it'd break the machine and probably break myself too. You now that's uh, kind of important. But for a lot of people, uh, deep pressure is calming. Now it doesn't work on everybody. This is where sensory things are extremely variable. But some people, a weighted vest is helpful, a weighted blanket is helpful. Other people, it doesn't work. One kid will have sound sensitivity. Another kid may have problems with certain kinds of lights that flicker. Fluorescent lights are getting phased out, but some of the cheap LEDs will flicker. And so if you have a child that has this problem, you have to um, let them pick out the lights to use. Also, some kids will see the print jiggle on the page. And one of the things that can help that is try printing the homework on pale gray paper, pale tan paper, pale light blue paper different pale pastel papers, and nobody knows why it works. It, and it only works on a subgroup of dyslexics. This is why it's been difficult to get evidence-based stuff on this because it's mixed all together. But you're talking about it's safe, it's cheap, and it takes you 15 minutes to try it. Go ahead and try it. I've seen college careers saved with that. Tan paper in the printer, lavender paper in the printer, maybe buy some pink sunglasses, that saved another another uh, kid's class, um, co college career right here at CSU. Mm -hmm. So That's what you're awesome. talking about here are, are these, these, sen these sensitivities, this kind of sensory overload That's and a recognizing ways to overcome those. The, I think a lot of us have seen our, our children where we might be seeing a behavior issue, but it's actually tied to a sensory overload. Mm -hmm. How can a parent tease out okay, this is just a behavior problem I'm, I need to deal with in a traditional way, or no, 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 there's a sensory issue underneath it all. Well, I, my mind tends to categorize things. So the first step, let's say we have a lot of outbursts, meltdowns, whatever you want to call them. You got to figure out, is it biology or is it behavior? Now, if it's happening in a really noisy environment, okay, you got to be a good detective here. Does this tend to happen in a noisy place, noisy cafeteria, train station? a uh, big chaotic, big noisy restaurant with a band playing. Okay, that's more likely to be sensory overload. If it's a nonverbal person, they might have a hidden painful medical problem they can't tell you about. There's been individuals that have died of things like a burst appendix. Okay, behavior, um, 
they, uh, I used to throw a fit to get out of doing something. But the other thing is frustration with not being able to communicate. This is especially true in nonverbal and partially verbal, even some of the fully verbal. It, remember that small processor. It takes time to download the web page. That is the word. A lot of these kids, they're like accessing the internet on a really bad connection or on a phone that only has one bar of service. So if you try to make them respond fast, it freezes. So frustration with communication. And here's a simple thing you can do for um, the nonverbals. It's called the tablet with uh, text messaging in airplane mode. And you could, anybody can have that. And then maybe uh, get out of doing something or to get attention. So you've got to figure out. So here's the categories, sensory overload, hidden painful medical problem. Those are two biologies. Behaviors, frustration because it can't communicate, get out of doing something or get attention. Okay, those are the categories. Then you've got to figure out, you know, you can keep track of it, of where it happens. Now on the sensory overload, and especially with kids under 12, and there is evidence-based on a thing called environmental enrichment is an effective treatment for autism. It's an adjunct to other therapies. And what you do is you stimulate two senses at the same time with a lot of emphasis on touch and smell. You need three key words to find that paper. Autism, environmental enrichment. Use uses simple household things. And you're stimulating two senses at the same time. And then you don't do vision and hearing together, but you might do aromatherapy and touch a cold water glass. And then you might do a different aromatherapy and uh, touch carpet sample. You know, it used uh, simple things and I think it helps desensitize. And the other thing it helps is um, where the child controls it. But some of these kids are gonna have to have time to chill out and calm down and chill out breaks. They're gonna need that. I know a lady who's an engineer, she works on computerized controls for industrial equipment. She has her own company. Oh, I went in the coolest factory. They made giant gears, it's like so cool. And, and she has to chill out for an hour every afternoon, but she has a successful business. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, to finding out what those coping mechanisms need to be. But there's Along the lines of- Generalize about these things is you gotta find out is it sensory, if it's happening in a noisy, chaotic place, or it could be the wrong kind of lighting and the lighting's flickering like a discotheque. And the problem with the LEDs now, I don't know which ones flicker and which ones don't because I don't have the problem. So I can't test the lights. And there's all these newfangled electronic bulbs because the old fashioned bulbs that waste energy did not flicker. Our mm -hmm. store doesn't even sell those anymore. Yeah. Along the lines of the behavior challenges, um, another question that we've had coming up is often children with autism have a difficult time transitioning from one activity to another. I know in my own case, when my child was younger, I had to, I had to give them a 10 minute heads up and then transition right when I said, or it wasn't gonna work. What, what's, 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 going, what's going on underneath, underneath that kind of behavior? Well, one of the big problems is, is sudden change. Surprises scare. Well, you could have like a, something where the clock counts down, something like that. One very innovative place with nonverbal individuals, the way they did transitions is five minutes before the shower, they gave them a washcloth to hold. Five minutes before dinner, a, a, a spoon to hold. A five minutes before the bus, a toy bus to hold. It was actually a touch schedule. Um, because that's not, it, but something where uh, you know it's coming up. You see, I learned with the old, big old school clock where the hands went around how I learned time, big clock about this big, and the minute hand would go around, and then the, the second hand would go around, then the minute hand would go click, and you could actually see it move. That was very helpful. You can still get battery operated versions of that clock, but something where uh, it, he's got a warning of when it's, it's gonna happen will be helpful. And then eventually, the more you do it, you get used to it. Yeah, that makes sense. Switching gears a little bit, we're getting a lot of questions about what was your favorite subject to study in school? My favorite subject was biology. I loved biology. I thought that was just so interesting. And I also liked botany too. Um, but I, that's the one class I got A's in. I got decent grades in that all through um, school. I just thought it was just, um, just so interesting. And then related, um, you mentioned that you loved art. Are you still involved in art today? 
Well, not really. All right now I'm trying to get a lot of writing done and I'm uh, doing a lot of conferences. I kind of feel now at the age I'm at, I want to try to help uh, you know, the kids that are in the pipeline now to get out and be successful. Maybe go out and have that cool business. Um, I, I went through a whole list of all the uh, people I worked with uh, the, on building these factories. And I'm amazed, 20% of them are special ed department. They were that bad student took that welding class. To be that, well, that oppositional defiant student took a, an auto mechanics class. Uh, and we need these people and they're not gonna be able to do algebra. Let's just skip it. Uh, they're not gonna be chemists, but what they do, it's coming over here right now. 100 shipping containers, very high wage country. We're not talking about t-shirts from uh, cheap t-shirts or underwear. You're talking about very specialized, difficult to manufacture equipment. Yeah. And a zillion patents to go along with it. Yeah. We, we have a question related to the educational system. We have a lot of special education teachers on, on the call with us today. What, what advice would you give to someone who's looking to become a special education teacher or someone who already is? Well, let's look at the um, working on the strengths, using different teaching methods. You know, as an employer, I don't really care how you teach reading. But for most jobs, I need a decent sixth grade level of reading. And the common core is correct on that. I don't have any problem with the verbal part of it. Uh, and... I don't care whether they learn with phonics, whole word, or some other new method. I want them to be able to read. Then the other issue that comes up is comprehension. Let's break it down. There's different levels of comprehension. There's the vocabulary level of comprehension. Like Jane went to the store and bought uh, uh, biscuits. Okay, that's vocabulary level. But let's say it's Jane went to the store and she bought birthday candles and cake mix. Okay, now the next level is what kind of party is she gonna have? See how that's the next level of comprehension. But on the vocabulary level, you've got the, the kid has to know the words because there was some reading test years ago where they talked about gates in slalom skiing for the Olympics. Well, if you live in, in a warm part of the world, you know what slalom skiing is. You see, uh, if you live in Japan, there was a thing about a guy who climbed over the fence at the White House and went across the lawn. Well, in Japan, the kid may not know what a lawn is. And then, okay, the next level, that was a case where somebody climbed over the fence of the White House, ran across the lawn, opened the door, and then he got tackled by the Secret Service. Okay, that's the vocabulary level. But if I don't know what a lawn is, okay, why does that matter so much? Whose house is it? You see, that's the next level of reading comprehension whose house is it that goes beyond the vocabulary level. And you're gonna teach these kids by a lot of specific examples like that, just with specific examples. That's how I would learn that sort of stuff. Yeah, and, and as, as you were talking, I, I know in one of, your, uh, one of your books, you talk about how your mind is like a database. And actually, could you go over that? How, like for example, a story I've heard you share is just for example, how you learned what a cat is. The more things I experience, the more pictures I have in the database, but it's associated. So if you want to find out how my mind works, um, it shows in the HBO movie where the word shoe is said, and it's showing all these pictures of shoes coming up, but then it can get off the subject. All right, now give me a keyword, but think of something really original, really original for keyword, and I'll tell you how my mind accesses it. Oh, you're putting me on the spot. Like not, not, don't do <laughs> chair or something like that. Get really original. Bicycle. Well, I'm seeing bicycles right now. I had as a child. I had a blue uh, Schwinn with big fat tires. And then I got an English Raleigh. I was so happy when I got that. Now I'm seeing places I went to on my bikes, like going downtown when I was eight to buy comics and little airplanes. So now I'm on the Superman comics. Now I'm seeing the first Superman annual. They got thrown out and we moved. They'd be worth a lot right now. So that's how I got from bicycles. I started off with bicycles that I had. Now I'm seeing another bike I had when I was in Arizona uh, to a place I went with a bike. Then things I bought on the trip with the bike. 
you see there's a, there's an associative link there. It's, it's not random. Right. Okay, that's how it works, but it's associative thinking where verbal thinking is extremely linear. But associative thinkers often come up with original ideas. There's also some very interesting research that's just, uh, you know, was written up in Nature just the, uh, recently uh, that a scientist that uh, won the Nobel Prize is more likely to have a creative hobby. That's another reason for not taking out art classes or theater classes or music. So when, I, when, we, when we talk about learning, you know, through lots of examples, so the example of the bicycle is helpful. When it comes to abstract concepts, so for example, emotions. I know with my own child, we literally had some flashcards of facial expressions oh, to I'm teach emotions. All the emoji things. Right. So how, like how, how would, yeah, how would you describe your experience of understanding what the different emotions are of other people and learning? Well, emotions? it just has to be explained. Okay, smiling or happy. Um, this is, you know, you just have to explain it with pictures. You have to explain it. It's not abstract. You know, then you tell some philosophy stuff, existentialism, uh, something or other. Well, I come up with it with uh, associations that I know are wrong. You know, this is the problem I have with algebra. It's totally abstract. With trigonometry, I can see how you use that for the suspension bridge, for the cables on the suspension bridge, the trig function for that. That I can understand because uh, there's something specific there I use it for. Now I can learn, okay, pi times the radius squared for uh, sizing hydraulic cylinders. I just memorized that formula uh, and, and use it for something very specific. Mm -hmm. Because when you're actually out working on a job, okay, let's say you're in metal building fabrication, you use certain formulas to calculate roof trusses. You don't use them for all other kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. But the pure Along algebra is, it, it's too abstract. Right. Continuing down the path of, of the, this, this subject of emotion. So many children with autism, young adults with autism, probably even adults with autism are often subject to bullying. Oh, Have you ever experienced bullying and, and what was your experience and what advice can you give? Elementary school, good. Because Mrs. Deach, my third grade teacher, the head teacher for elementary school did what's called peer mediated intervention. Except she didn't know about that. What she did is she explained to the other students that I had a handicap that was not visible like a wheelchair and that they should be helping me. So I managed to get through elementary school without bullying. High school was torture. I was kicked out of a regular high school for fighting because I was bullied. And then I ended up going to special school. They put me to work running a horse barn, three years of no studying, but I learned how to work. But the only places that I was not bullied was shared interests. Riding horses, electronics, and model rockets. We need to be getting these kids into shared interests. You know, one mom will say, my autistic kid's in band at the big high school and it's great. And another kid's over at the big high school and it's horrible. And, and so much depends too on the particular parents and the particular uh, school too. I don't wanna to talk about the public versus private stuff. In engineering, we have a term called site specific that I really like. Yeah, that particular school, particular situation. Private may work in one situation, public school works in another situation. I, and I know bullying was a real problem. Get friends who shared interests. Yeah, one other piece of advice I'll throw into you is I know with, with my own son, we would actually sit down with his class in elementary school and explain how he interacted with other children when the children understood they seem to be really supportive of him. So there's and some hope out there. That's what they call peer mediated intervention. All right. It's an evidence based. It took me a while to learn that jargon. Yeah. Well, I, I remember I was in a hotel room on my phone looking this stuff up. I, it makes a big I, world of difference, I think, when people that, understand. And I used that peer mediated intervention keyword. And then I was able to find a whole lot of other stuff. Right. All right, switching gears again, <laughs> we have a question coming in where, so you're a visual learner. How, how, how does a visual learner learn to write since that's such a verbal thinking activity? I narrate the pictures. That's how I learned to write. And that made me really good at things like explaining different patterns, movement patterns for working cattle. I, I can see it and explain it. I also was brought up in the neighborhood where people spoke English correctly. And, and uh, so I learned, is this the way that people would sound? 
And then the other thing is they marked up my papers. They'd mark up my papers and correct them. Now that's mostly bad for self-esteem. That's how I learned how to write. Mm -hmm. Diagramming sentences was useless for me. But for the person that's more verbal, it's the way to go. Again, I have had graduate students. They thank me for marking up their papers. Another thing I have them do is read them out loud. Now, when you read it out loud, read it out loud like you're going to give a speech. That's been really helpful. And then on one of the chemical engineering magazine that I get, there was a professor saying, read them out loud with gusto. And he was telling postdocs and graduate students to do that. But for another student, the diagramming of the sentences is the way to go. You see, I, this is where you use the method that works. Diagramming sentences for me, is useless. Yeah. But for somebody else, it's the way to go. All right, makes sense. Um, one, qu one housekeeping question I'm gonna answer is, I'm getting questions on if people will be able to watch this session later. Yes, we are recording it and we will have it up on our YouTube channel pretty soon after the, the session is over today. So if you have to drop off early, you can catch the end. All right, let me keep diving into some more questions. Um, one question is about, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just read it. My 17 year old daughter is on the autism spectrum. She's very specific about time. For example, if I tell her we are going to leave for an appointment at 445, she expects us to leave at exactly 445. What might a person with autism, why might a person with autism be so specific about time in this way? Well, I'm kind of specific that way too. And let me tell you, the airlines are specific in that way and they'll leave you behind. I So, there are some things that are see, and that came immediately to my mind of something where if they're run if they're running good that day and there's no storms, you're gonna be left behind if you're five minutes late. Right. And so there's some, you know, and then there's other situations where you could make a category family, maybe we've got a little leeway as to time. But things like the bus, you better be there. That's it. the train, you better be there some places where it needs to be specific. And then maybe you make another category of times where it's not so specific. Maybe that, that would be- That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, so basically you're not, you're, you're saying in, in, these in, in, in these situations, you need to be exactly precise. In these other situations, you don't have to be. And the leeway is five minutes early or five minutes late and it's well, okay. Oh yeah, the train station, I've run up there and the train's left without me, you know, yeah. missed the connection. Like, yeah. uh, like my brother would go on a train and he had, you had time just to walk over the stairway and switch trains and you had to do it pretty quickly or you got left. Right, right. Had this to. is this is personally helpful to me, Dr. Grannon, because I'm, my son is learning to drive right now and teaching him the speed limit and when you can go a little bit faster than the speed limit has been a challenging conversation. Let me talk about driving. Okay. Because of the multitasking issues, the operation of the car has to get into motor memory before you do traffic. I did 200 miles on dirt roads on my aunt's ranch. It was three miles up to the mailbox, three miles back. And a lot of these individuals are going to need a lot more practice in a totally safe place so that steering, brakes, and accelerator is on autopilot. And I had to learn on a manual. Now, one advantage I did have, I knew how to steer. And we've got kids growing up today that haven't done steering things. So I didn't have to learn how to steer. But I did have, so I had to learn how to use a really horrible clutch, three on the tree, horrible clutch. I, mo today, most people aren't going to have to do that. But I recommend a lot more practice. Driver's ed will chuck them into it too fast. Let's start in the middle of big parking lots, dry fields, deserted office parks, places that are really safe. All right, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, going back to some something you were talking about earlier about, you know, we have we have a generation of kids who who are addicted to video games. And I think that does, I think that goes well beyond children who are, are on the autism spectrum. What what advice would you give parents in terms of pulling them away and getting them interested in other things so that they're not so drawn to just video games? You have to replace it with something else. I recommend an hour a day for the for that sort of thing. And that's why I did this book right here, Calling All Minds. It's all of my childhood projects, little kites and things, because a lot of kids today are afraid to make a mistake. But I had to tinker and tinker and tinker to get my parachute to work so it would open and, and I learned how to cut uh, coat hangers with pliers when I was uh, barely, I could make a dent in it and then I'd have to go like this. You know, when you do hands-on things, you have to figure out how to do it. 
And I think that a lot of kids are growing up not do, figuring those things out, uh, not enough of figuring things out. And it's got, you know, simple uh, projects in it. I'm finding out right now, when I did a book signing for that book, uh, like two years ago, I found out that 20 or 30% of kids in Denver area had never made a paper airplane. Okay, now one of the projects in there is paper snowflake. And I had a teacher ask me this year, well, actually 2020, this year, what would happen to a kid's self-esteem? They cut this wrong and it fell apart. I'm going, really? You get another piece of printer paper, you try again. And then I want you to look it up yourself on YouTube and figure out how to do it. Your self-esteem over a piece of printer paper. I, I, I was asked that absolutely seriously. Mm -hmm. No, we they, we need to be they need to be doing some of these other things. Yeah. You know, and now there are some. Um, I was looking at this Amplify program for little kids. I really like the science stuff for the little kids in that. I think it got off a bit ba uh, off base for the older kids, but for the little kids, get them outside, get them doing things, get them observing. That I liked. Mm -hmm. But then when they got older, then the periodic table of the elements wasn't supposed to be there. You see, that's an example of getting too rigid where I like the stuff for the second graders because I went and looked it up and I go, this looks nice uh, for second graders. But then you're going to get a math head that needs to get more, you know, get, get some pure math in there, the old fashioned stuff. Then you yeah. give them that stuff. You see, there's a tendency in education to get just way too single minded on stuff. Mm -hmm. I, in construction, and I spent 25 years in construction, it's all about outcomes. You get to build and build. We got two gorgeous buildings on campus. One has a steel frame and one has a concrete frame and they're both gorgeous. Yeah, I, I do really appreciate the, the focusing on the strengths because it is amazing what you can build on top of that when you can find those and, and, and focus in on them. Yeah. And you can work math and reading into cooking, into sewing, into woodworking, measuring. Um, my, in my class, I have a, I have a, students have to learn how to use a scale ruler and I've got students in my class right now who have never used a ruler to measure anything, anything. That's in the last five years. Yeah. I will say we, we have a functional math class in our, in our catalog and it's all about what you're talking about. It's using a ruler to measure things around your house. It's yeah. about pouring liquids into a measuring cup and understanding what that means. And like, and it's called well, functional math. And you can do work math and, you know, um, let's say you got to do two thirds of a recipe. Mm -hmm. That's some real practical math. But then yeah. I look at some of the stuff they're algebraifying everything. I don't think I need to algebraify uh, how much road a county can build in a year. I mean, really? Yeah. I saw that made into algebra. I'm going, you got to be joking. Yeah. yeah. Chemistry. Yes. Linear uh, artificial intelligence. You're going to need linear algebra. I don't have any idea what to do with it. All I do know is that closed captioning with AI worked really, really well the other day. I couldn't believe how well it worked. Only made one mistake. Impressive. All right. Another question that's switching gears quite a bit. A lot of a lot of people with autism have a difficult time making eye contact. I know I've spoken to a few people who are adults, and they've told me that when they when they make eye contact with someone, it feels like the person is looking deep into their soul, and it's way too intimate. What is do, do you have to have difficulties with eye contact, and what, where what is that? What's what's behind that? Well, part of it has to do with going back to that small processor. I. Uh, when I'm very, very tired in a noisy environment, I'll never forget, see, my mind thinks in specific examples. I was in an airport, I don't remember which one, but I remember going up the ticket counter and having to deal with a reservation and I couldn't hear very well. And if I looked at the, at the, at the, at the person's eyes, it was even worse on hearing. You see, because it's sometimes hard for some people on the spectrum to use two senses at once. And I know that that's part of the problem. And some autistic adults talk about burnout and masking. Most of this masking stuff is they're forced into environments where uh, they're getting sensory overloaded. And the other problem is a small processor. Like I cannot remember a verbal string of information. Let's say there's some task that I have to do that has five or six steps. I have to write them down, even now. Pilots checklist, not optional for pilots. Very, very easy thing to do, make a little checklist. And, and my working memory is terrible. And I, I, um, I have to write phone numbers down. 
and I have to be really concentrate, like write Zoom numbers down. My students like standing behind me and I said, uh, this is just today. You've got to let me write this down. And it had a lot of other code around it. So I had to dig out the Zoom call number and I wanted to make sure I didn't write it down. Yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. All right, we're getting close on time. So I'm gonna ask one more wrap up question before I hand it back over to Brian to, to, uh, to give us the details of the contest again. Um, one of the one of from from a previous talk I've listened to from from you, one of my favorite quotes that you said is, "With enough access to education and enough practice, you can do anything." Um, and I and I see this I, I see this as it relates to tutoring and and the academic supports that we're trying to do at Varsity Tutors. Well, tell us tell us the role that you think tutoring should play in in the life of a child who is is in the, on the autism spectrum well, and mother tutor with all the other services. Mother tutored me in phonics. Okay, I got the service from my own mother, but I wouldn't have learned to read without phonics, but I wanna emphasize, don't shove phonics down the throat of a kid who's not a phonics learner. Um, when I, uh, algebra, um, I had a great science teacher. He got me motivated to study. He never could teach me algebra. Statistics, a little more visual, tons of tutoring, tons of tutoring for my masters and for my doctorate, tons of tutoring. And the big mistake that a lot of people make is they wait until they wreck a course before they ask for help. I asked for help and I failed the first quiz. A lot of kids that are failing don't get help soon enough. I can't emphasize that enough. No, I, I wobbled through statistics with a C as in Charlie and I had to be tutored and tutored and tutored, but I managed to get through that. Algebra is hopeless. And I, I don't keep a kid out of auto mechanics or out of um, you know welding shop or something like that um, because they can't do algebra. You need us to prevent things like Fukushima burning up. You need us. You need us visual thinkers. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Grandin. And, and, it, and it makes me feel better to hear how much tutoring you had because I needed a lot of tutoring in college as well. <laughs> With that, I'll hand it back over to Brian. My mother spent about an hour or four afternoons a week for about two and a half months. And, for, and then let's get a book worth reading. And she'd read out loud and stop writing the really interesting part and have me do a few words. And then gradually I read more and more out loud and she read less and less and get a book that's like the Wizard of Oz, something worth reading. Great advice. Perfect. Hey, huge thanks to uh, to both of you, Dr. Grandin, for uh, for all of your time and insights. And um, you know, I think for uh, for those who uh, want to know a little bit more about um, you know some of some of Dr. Grandin's thoughts, well, on the way out, we've got a couple um, announcements, I guess, to show you. So we'll uh, we'll kind of show off uh, the one of the websites, the uh, the autism website, um, and uh, you know, not the uh, the livestock website. Um, so we'll have that up on the way out. And then again, a huge thanks to Doreen. I know how um, personal this is for you as as a passion to make sure that you know. Different learners get all the, the different types of support they need. So with that in mind, I um, want to call out that this is part of an ongoing speaker series. Dr. Grandin will be back in uh, in just a few weeks. Um, a week from tonight, we'll uh, we'll have Wright's Law back, Pete Wright from Wright's Law, talking about uh, you know uh, you know some of the specific kind of uh, time sensitive how how COVID may be impacting students with uh, with learning differences and what you can do about it. Um, and then there are also a whole lot of uh, of classes you know for the learners in your life. Um, you know they both. Both Dr. Grandin and, and Doreen mentioned how uh, the right interventions, um, you know, the right grouping and, and, and really honoring how different types of minds learn differently can be so helpful. So I want to make sure you know of, of all the different resources. I say all there. These are some uh, all would uh, would be require a whole lot smaller font, but um, some of the upcoming and ongoing resources available to, uh, to you and your family. Um, and then also want to make sure that uh, you are aware of, of the contest rules. Um, we've already seen some of these uh, social media lighting up a little bit, but um, if you did learn something, you know, particular tonight that uh, you want to share with your network, um, you know, we really encourage that um, you'll be entered to win. Um, you know, both Dr. Grandin and, and Doreen have mentioned how tutoring was instrumental for them. You'll enter to win five hours of tutoring for a learner in your family. 
and a signed copy of one of Dr. Grandin's books. I know Doreen had one on display right behind her there, but you'll uh, you will make sure we personalize it to you. So here are the uh, the rules for that contest, and, and a couple places you can find out a little bit more about the services of our city tutors and uh, and uh, how to to find more information from Dr. Grandin. Although I'll put in that plug, she'll be back here in uh, in just a couple of weeks. So with that, a, a huge thanks not just to our presenters, but to all of you for so many questions. Um, it's really fun to see um, uh, the chat light up with with so many questions questions and gracious comments. So thank you all for all of that. Um, we'll toggle back and forth between these slides. If there's any information you want to make sure you write down correctly, kind of to, uh, to honor uh, what Dr. Grandin had, uh, had said is so important. So we'll toggle back and forth uh, between these on the way out. But uh, for now, huge thanks, everybody.